The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Jesus said to the Jewish crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, amen, amen, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him." Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. This past spring, Harvard University, with their Multicultural Extension Commission, decided to allow the Satanic Temple of New York to have a black mass on campus. Now, a black mass is Satan worship. They pervert and mock our mass. What happens is a Satan worshiper will go to a Catholic Mass early in the morning, receive communion on the hand, and walk out of the church with that sacred host. Then that night, they gather, and as I mentioned, they mock our Mass, they worship Satan, and then they desecrate the consecrated host, usually by defecation. Well, thank God, there is such an outrage because of this that Harvard canceled having this black mass on campus. Nevertheless, it was held off-site. In response, at St. Paul's Catholic Church, where the campus ministry program is held, they had a holy hour and then a Eucharistic procession. And that brought hundreds, if not thousands, of people. But think for a minute. What is it that the Satan worshipers believe about the Holy Eucharist that even so many Catholics do not. Now, consider this too. If someone had drawn a swastika on a synagogue or burned a Koran or said some kind of racial comment as did Donald Sterling of the LA Clippers, the news media would have been all over it. We would have had national news attention, apologies from the White House and so on. Nothing was said. Why? because maybe the news media doesn't want people to investigate, to question what do Catholics really believe. And the point is this, my brothers and sisters, we believe that the Holy Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. We believe this. Now, if the Satan worshipers believe this, you and I must believe this too. And why? Listen to the words of the gospel. Jesus, in the sixth chapter of St. John's gospel, which I encourage you to go home and read in its entirety, speaks about the Eucharist. He began by first performing that miracle of the loaves and the fish, whereby he took five loaves and fed over 5,000. When he's asked, well, what's all this about? He gives this beautiful teaching. He says, I am the bread of life come down from heaven. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. For my life 
My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. Those words foreshadow what happens at the Last Supper. There our Lord, with his apostles, offer a Passover meal. Jesus takes bread. He takes wine. Over the unleavened bread, he says, this is my body. Over that chalice of wine, he says, this is my blood. Our Lord wasn't just doing something nice and symbolic. He miraculously was sharing with his apostles his body, blood, soul, and divinity. With the same efficacious words by which he could transform five loaves to feed 5,000, or transform water into wine at the wedding feast of Cana, or heal the blind man, the paralyzed man, the woman with the hemorrhage, raise Lazarus from the dead. With the same efficacious words, our Lord was miraculously, albeit mysteriously, sharing with his apostles his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Granted, the characteristics did not change because our Lord has to make the sacrament palatable for us, but the what it is did change. But this event of the Last Supper is connected to what happens on Good Friday. For there, Jesus, as a priest, offers himself as the sacrifice for our sins on the altar of that cross. His body is given for us. His blood is shed for us. He forgives our sins. He makes the new covenant. And that event is linked with Easter. For our Lord gloriously rises from the dead, body, blood, soul, and divinity rises from the dead, and then at the ascension goes to his heavenly Father. Nevertheless, he's with us sacramentally, miraculously, he's with us in the gift of the Holy Eucharist. When we heard the passage from St. Paul, recall in the first century, St. Paul's talking about the Mass that we have to this very day. That at this Mass, we're fed with God's Word. And then the priest, who's ordained to act in the person of Christ, who shares in the authority given to the apostles through holy orders, offers the sacrifice that lives in the everlasting sacrifice of our Lord. And so, when the priest takes that bread and wine and he says the words of consecration, the words of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the will of the Father, that bread and wine is changed, truly changed, into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. The characteristics, shape, touch, smell, and so on, those don't change. But the what it is, the substance changes. Hence the word transubstantiation. The key is we are not just receiving blessed bread or blessed wine. We're receiving the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. When communion is finished, what do we do? We take the blessed sacrament and reserve it in the tabernacle. It doesn't go back in the box of hosts that we use for consecration. No, the tabernacle where Christ truly is present. And so, my brothers and sisters, what a great gift we have in the Holy Eucharist to think Christ shares in this most intimate way his very being, his life with us. Now, granted, poor little human beings that we are, at times we may have doubts, especially when we look at our world and we face all the technology and science and so on, and we might ask, well, how does it really happen? Well, this feast day of Corpus Christi was actually instituted 750 years ago, and it sort of coincides with those questions. Back in the year 1263, a very humble, good, pious priest named Peter of Prague, he's from Prague in the Czech Republic, was traveling to Rome on pilgrimage. He stopped at the little town of Balsena, about 100 miles north of Rome. And poor Peter was a good priest, but he wondered, does it really happen? He prayed for faith. He prayed that he could truly, totally believe so early morning, 
he awoke, went to the little church of St. Christina, the tomb where the martyr is buried, a martyr of our early church. And there are a few faithful there too. And he offered the mass. When he took the host, the unleavened bread, and he said the words of consecration, this is my body, the host began to bleed. And the blood went over his fingers and then stained the corporal, the altar cloth. Well, of course, he was awestruck. He began to cry. All the people around were awestruck. What to do? Well, Pope Urban IV was staying at the neighboring town of Orvieto. And so they gathered up everything that was there, all the witnesses, and Peter of Prague went to Orvieto, explained to Pope Urban what had happened. He declared this to be a miracle. One could go today to the Cathedral of Orvieto and see the blood-stained corporal still preserved, even though it's been 750 years. Because of this, in 1264, Pope Urban made this the feast day of Corpus Christi for good reason. We need to believe and to renew our belief. But what do we do? Well, my brothers and sisters, in our world today, where there is so much confusion, let alone disbelief, even among Catholics, you and I need to increase our own faith by God's grace through reverence, a key virtue. Mass is meant to be reverent, joyful but reverent. Part of that begins with how we prepare. So I would encourage you, before you come to Mass, maybe Saturday evening even, maybe read the readings. If you get that little publication, the Magnificat, it's a good way to help you. Also, look at yourselves. We have to do an examination of conscience. If we went further in St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he says, anyone who receives the Holy Eucharist unworthily brings condemnation. So if we were in a state of mortal sin, or maybe we haven't been to confession in a year, we ought to go to confession before receiving the Holy Eucharist. This is good examination and preparation. But then Sunday needs to be God's day. It's good to see you all, but I really challenge you parents, make sure your children appreciate this. Sunday's God's day. It's a time to worship God, to rest, to be with your family. Too often times, the influence of Satan has families being busy, going everywhere, doing all kinds of activities, trying to catch up on life, instead of letting Sunday be God's day. And when you're coming to church, remind your children, it's church. It's coming to visit God, to be in God's house, to worship God. Also, prepare yourselves by even how you dress. I'm always very saddened when I see little kids especially, sometimes adults, dirty hands, dirty faces, hairs all messed up, like roll out of bed clothes and so on. We're coming for God. We need to put ourselves in the right disposition. Come early if you can. I myself have to have a few minutes of quiet before I offer Mass. Otherwise, my brain is clouded. I'm sure same for you all. So try to come early. Settle down. Pray in the pews. Clear the mind. And then, also, as you enter the church, of course, take some of the holy water, make the sign of the cross. This reminds us of our baptism. That's our identity as a Christian, a member of the church. Genuflect before going into the pew. As Mass begins, be sure to pray. Pray the prayers, sing the songs, follow along with the readings. I have to do that because otherwise I get distracted. So following along and reading and praying the prayers and singing the songs helps me give my attention. Sometimes I look out, though, and it's like I'm in the garden of statues. It's like no one's moving their lips. No one's picked up a hymnal. We need to engage ourselves. And think of that. We're engaging ourselves. That's what worship is, to lift up our hearts. I'm sure many of you sing in the bathroom shower. I'm sure. Don't you feel happier for doing that? Well, if we sing here at God's house, 
and we pray here in God's house, and we're really reading the readings, we're going to feel spiritually better, and our minds will be more in tune. But then, of course, communion. And here's always the annual review for communion. So when you're coming up the aisle, hands should be folded. We aren't getting on a bus or a plane. Hands are folded. When you're almost in front of the priest or the minister, you make a profound bow or a genuflection. If I could put in an altar rail, I would. It'd help a lot. But nevertheless, we have that sense of reverence. Now there's an option. The church prefers, actually, to receive on the tongue. Or you may receive on the hand. But if you're going to receive on the hand, hands stay folded, priest says body of Christ, you respond, amen, put out your tongue, then make the sign of the cross, go back to the pew. If you're going to receive on the hand, you make a throne for God. You have to have two hands. That goes back to even the early church times. The hand you take on the bottom. The hand should be clean. So while it's nice to have a little person have hi father on the hand, seen it, or a happy face, I like happy faces, or you have the adult that has a phone number, I'm like, I guess they want a date with me or something like that, you know, <laughs> nevertheless, hands should be clean. So in front of the priest, priest says body of Christ, you say amen, priest puts host on hand, step to the side, adore, take, consume, sign of the cross. Now, if you go, like a body snatcher, back to your pew without consuming the host, I follow you because, one, Satan worshipers, two, I found two hosts in our hymnals in the past few years, and I did catch someone with a host in her pocket as she's leaving the church. So, good reason. Don't be offended, but take time, step to the side, consume. Now, the proper response is amen. I say body of Christ, you say amen. Once I said body of Christ and the person said, I am. And I thought, well, jump in the tabernacle, would you please? You know, if you are. All right. Now I've seen it all. So for those of you who use your tongues, tongue comes out. Don't be a clam where I have to poke Jesus in there. All right. Or there's the snappers, right? It's like, oh, oh, lost a finger. I hope Obamacare pays for it. Or, you know, you have the, the lizards. All right. For you hand people, remember, thrown for God? Not the jugglers. You have the jugglers, right? And you try to put Jesus there. There's the basket weavers, like that. Venus fly traps are doing this thing. And then, of course, you have the praying mantises. And then, of course, one of my favorites, are pro-choice Catholics that give me the option. Like that. <laughs> no. We want to be reverent. Now part of the reverence too is you go back to the pew, you pause, and you pray. Holy Communion brings us into a communion with the Lord. This is a good time then to open up our hearts Pray for our loved ones. Pray for our needs. Pray for the broader community. Think of all the poor Catholics in Syria and Iraq today who might not live through the Mass because someone may terrorize them. Think of that. We ought to be thinking of the broader communion. We could be praying for our deceased loved ones, especially those souls in purgatory. It's a time for communion. But I'd ask you to pray for something else. I have tried to do my best to instruct, but there are some people that just chronically, for whatever reason, leave after Mass. I don't know why. It's not as though they're sick. This is chronic. Let's pray for them. Because just to walk out the door, having received our Lord, is no better than Judas. And that's a sacrilege, to just walk out, not finishing the Mass, not finishing this most beautiful act of worship is a sacrilege. So let's pray for their conversion today at this Mass and every Mass. It's always very sad. I remember just about a month ago, Father Shear was going a little bit longer at the 5 o'clock Mass on Saturday, 
and I was standing in the narthex, and one guy went out and he says, you only get 60 minutes. You only get 60 minutes, God? Is that all you get? How do you expect to get to heaven if you put God on a time clock? So, let's pray for their conversion. But then too, I would challenge you, especially during the summertime, on Thursdays, come here for maybe 10 minutes when we have adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, or come to daily mass one time a week. I guarantee you, just as Archbishop Sheen said, if you open your lives to the presence of the Holy Eucharist, our Lord will transform your life. Guaranteed. How wonderful it is to know that our Lord truly comes to share his life with our lives, to share each moment in our joys as well as our sorrows, in our good times as well as our toughest times. This is the gift we celebrate today. Let us take it to heart then and really give thanks to God. May God bless you.